you think this is Melo's last season in the league no matter what? Or do you think there's any circumstance where you think he still plays in 2022, 2023, 2024? Uh, I would, if I, if I was a betting man, I just don't think he has it anymore. Should any team want Carmelo Anthony? Blasphemous. Yes, sir. Carmelo. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Control the Narrative, a podcast where we control the narrative that the media creates. If you're new around here, subscribe to catch our weekly podcast on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. And if you're a returner, a subscriber, or better yet, a Control the Narrative member, we appreciate the members a little bit more. But we appreciate everybody Appreciate everybody around here. It's our second episode back. Last week, we had former NBA player, former Denver Nugget, former Toronto Raptor, Gary Forbes on the show. If you have not watched that, go to our YouTube, the full channel, and watch that. Or Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you want to watch it or listen to it. Um, and check that out. It was a great interview. Gary was a real genuine dude with good energy. So it was cool. And if you haven't watched that, be sure to check that out. This week, we have a recurring guest uh, on to talk about the upcoming trade deadline. This is something that, as we sit here on January 31st at 9.20 p.m., um, we're talking about the same shit that we've been talking about since June for the most part, and really May. Uh, where should Melo go, all this shit. So we're going to try to figure everything out and try to place everybody into this mindset of where Melo, in, where Melo is in his decision-making process, if there is a decision, and all the shit of the state of the Melo union, I guess. So I'm going to welcome back my boy, and I don't know how many times you've been on here. I think probably like five, six times. Yeah, something like that. A recurring guest, Chris. Chris, thanks as always for hopping on, dude. Of course, man. Happy to be here as always. Always, man. We've been trying to get this uh, scheduled for a few weeks now, so hyped. Um, but not necessarily hyped to talk about the shit that we've been talking – that we're going to talk about tonight. So, like I mentioned, it's January 31st. February is tomorrow. Before we get into anything else – why do you, because I know that you have a lot of like gut feelings and that like you really take clues and, and piece them together well. Why do you think Carmelo Anthony is not in the league on January 31st? I think it's a combination of a couple of things. I think one, his age, because I think he has reached that natural point in his NBA career where most people, he's on a very, he was already on a very short list last year to be still playing at his age. Yep. Uh, and two, I think it's the effect of being on a team with high expectations that just really, really, really underperformed that had LeBron James on it. I think there's something about being on a team like that uh, and the rest of the league kind of like watching how all of that unfolded and then just deciding, well, okay, they had these aspirations. They had these players. This is – the turnout a disaster these guys don't equate to winning and we can argue to a blue in the face if that's fair or not but i i don't know the exact number but off the top of my head i think more than half their roster from last season is not in the league it's crazy guys on that list who are out of the league who are younger than mellow so i i think a lot of how that season <laughs> went down has to do with why those guys don't have jobs and it's frustrating, but here we are. You th- you think that's the main reason? I think it's a 50-50 split. With what, think, age and the team? Yes. I think if he was a few years younger and moved a little better laterally, he'd probably be in the league. Uh, Fair. I, th- I think it's just a – he was on this team – didn't equate to winning. They were awful defensively. None of those guys looked good together. He's 38, right? Yep. 37. 38? Turning 39 a couple more. You know, like that's – I think it's really tough because um, he's in the same draft class as LeBron. Dwayne Wade's retired. Chris Bosh hasn't been in the NBA in years. He, he unfortunately, with, you know, his blood clot situation, he couldn't play anymore. Forced yep. into retirement. You know, I don't think there's anyone from that 
draft class. I don't know if Haslam was in that draft class or not, mm-hmm. but it's, it's Haslam and LeBron James from that like generation of basketball. So he, if he's playing, he's in rare air. This would be year 20 for him. Kobe Bryant played 20 years. Like he's reached the natural conclusion anyway. Yeah. It's just unfortunate that he reached it and is in this situation. Yeah. Well said. Like, I, you sent me the graphic, right, of all the Lakers who weren't in the league anymore. Yeah. And I think it was like eight. Yeah. Like, it was a lot. Like, just off the top of my head, Dwight, Ken Bazemore. Uh, what's the Wayne, shooter? Wayne Ellington. Wayne Ellington. Um, Avery Bradley. Avery Bradley. Uh, DJ Augustine, who was there for a little bit. Uh, and Isaiah Thomas, who they signed at a pinch because of, you know, COVID related things. Yep. But he, Sick, bounced around on, he, he, bounced, he bounced around on multiple teams that season and he couldn't get a job this season. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, yeah. That's six off the top. And I, I'm pretty sure it was more than that. I'm sure. Rondo. Is, I thought Rondo was in Cleveland. I don't think so. Is he? Oh, you signed with the Cavs. Yeah, he's in Cleveland. Oh, he's in Cleveland. Okay. Oh, sorry. Who last played for the Cleveland Cavaliers? Oh, he got traded there last year. Yeah. But he is not on the team right now. Interesting. Yeah, man. It, it's weird. So, th- so there's another guy. So, like, fair. Like, again, <laughs> the whole point of the show is narratives and shit. And, and when we look at that Lakers team, you could point at so many different things as to why they played and performed the way, the way they performed last year. But for me, I think the main reason Melo isn't in the league right now is because of the Donovan Mitchell trade. And we talked about this a few months ago, but I I genuinely think that if the Knicks traded for Mitchell, Melo was a the Nick. They were yeah. going to trade Obi. There was also talks apparently about Randall either being included in that trade or a different trade. And that opens up that backup four spot. Melo slides in nicely. It becomes more of a win now team. Um, It makes perfect sense. And from everything we heard the entire summer, Mitchell to the Knicks, Mitchell to the Knicks, like it's just how is it going to get done? Not when is it going to get done? Not if it's going to get done. It was just, all right, cool. How is this going to happen? Is RJ going to be in the deal? Are they going to get four first round picks or like whatever all that talk was? And again, just I, I talked about it a few months ago, but at that point, that was in September or something like that. And a lot of teams had their backup fours. A lot of teams had their rosters set. And Melo has been adamant and, and vocal about wanting to remain close to his son. I don't know if you saw this. Cayenne yep. apparently is transferring. Oh, really? To Luhai out on Long Island. It's kind of cool. Very cool. cool. Um, so... Melo's been pretty adamant about that, about wanting to to stay close to him. So, you know, from everything that I'm hearing, he doesn't want to go to the West Coast. Like, he wants to stay close to Cayenne, whether that's at MSG, whether that's in Brooklyn, whether that's in Boston. Philly's probably not an option just because of their GM, Daryl Morey, but or present. I don't know what he is. But it just feels like that's what's going to happen. If it's not New York, if it's not Boston, if it's not a short – four or five hour trip and probably get private jets and, and charter flights and like that and, and shit like that in two seconds. So I feel like if it's not something on the East coast, it's probably not going to happen. Like I don't see him signing with Phoenix or the Lakers or the Blazers or, you know, any team like that. So I, I think to a certain extent it is his decision and he hasn't, we just talked about it real, real quick before I clicked record, but he hasn't been the best decision maker in his career and and you said you know to his whether it was his choice or not whether that was you know not going to chicago or signing that extension with the nuggets all these different things um so again i think it's just the mitchell trade put him in such a weird situation because it seemed like everybody was just banking on that and then when it didn't work out we're at this point now and and we'll get into like yo what's going to happen moving forward but to get to this position i feel like that's what happened and it sucks. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I mean, we can say, like, maybe he doesn't want to go to the West Coast or not. But, I mean, from that point, from since the Mitchell trade, you know, ended up with Cleveland, I mean, there really haven't been a lot of other opportunities 
to open up that kind of makes sense for him other than the Boston yep. one. I mean, yep. the areas where he would become a, an extremely attractive piece to a team is like if another Mitchell-like trade went down the season where it's a three-for-one kind of thing where someone's really kind of shifting their roster around. And those trades haven't happened yet. They could happen right. in a week or so, maybe. But, like, I think that is the other way that, you know, a team would call him at this point. Yo, sorry to interrupt you if you're watching this on YouTube or listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, but just wanted to let you know that we sell merch here at Control the Narrative. We got everything from t-shirts, like I got this Pixel Mellow t-shirt right next to me, then we got this Mellow Knicks wrap tee that we saw. This was a bestseller, as you can imagine. We got hoodies, we got New Era snapbacks, we got champion beanies, we got a lot of heat on the site for only Mellow fans, only those people who control narratives. Shop control the narrative.com. If you're watching this on YouTube, go ahead to the description. You'll see the link there. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, just type it in shop control the narrative.com. A bunch of heat. We're always dropping shit. So go check it out. I'm sure you'll find something you like. And now let's get back to the show. All right. So perfect transition. We're a little over a week away. What needs to happen for Melo to get back back on a court? So you just mentioned another Mitchell like trade. Is is that kind of it? Do you have one specific trade that if this went down, you don't see how Melo wouldn't sign to a team? Like, what is your thought process on, cool, in sure. two weeks, I could see Melo on a roster if blank happens? I mean, look, you know, we've talked about the next thing at nauseum. Ian Begley just had a mailbag uh, session on Twitter uh, the other day. I don't know yeah. if you saw it. And someone asked him. Do do you see the Knicks signing Mello as like a last man on the roster to kind of beef up the team before making a playoff run? And he said, yeah, I, I could see that. And to me, if they make some kind of move, you hear these rumors, OG Ananobi, you know, where we're giving up two, three players, some draft picks for one guy, maybe it's two to make the salary work. I don't know what kind of player that would be. I don't even know if the Knicks would keep that player. Um, but I think it's got to be something like that where we're giving away some kind of haul. All of a sudden, we've got a couple roster spots. Um, I know they're, they're uh, you know, comfortable with parting, I think, with Ryan Archie Diacono, who's on the end of their bench, who doesn't play. Like, I think they... that was a joke. I think that was a, a joke. Oh, that was a joke? Did I get yeah, joked? It was like, it was some shit like, uh, yo, the Knicks would be willing to part ways with Ryan, whatever his name is. <laughs> For like I'm so upset with myself now. It, it was I some bullshit like that. never get fooled by those things. I'm not, I'm not 100% sure, but I think no, it was like a trend right. going on. No, you're definitely right. That would make no sense. I I'm think it was like upset. a trend going on. I've lost on. all my credibility now. Yeah. I'm upset. Yeah, but yeah. again, just ignoring my stupidity, yeah. Uh, yeah, it has. It would have to be that kind of trade where they're moving multiple assets to get a pl like a single player, and all of a sudden they have some roster spots. And he makes sense. You know, I don't know what the buyout market's going to look like. Yeah. That always throws a monkey wrench into things. I feel like most seasons leading up to that, you kind of know two or three names that could be in that territory. Yeah. And I don't really have any. Uh, you know, I think Utah would be a candidate for something like that. But they're playing 500 to slightly below 500 ball. Like Danny Ainge doesn't want to give up anyone. Like I can't see him buying out anyone. I know Eric Gordon on the Rockets. He seems to clearly want to get out of there. Yeah. But again, like that's a clear trade ship. Like for a team that's rebuilding in Houston, you really definitely want to trade him for a pick or something. So I don't really know what the buyout market is going to be. If I had to take a guess, I would say it would be pretty bare. So that's where guys like Melo, DeMarcus Cousins – you know, Isaiah Thomas, like Rondo. Rondo come into play. You know, that's that's you know the another scenario. And then I guess the final one, which I think is the least unlikely, is a team who, you know, gets an injury after the trade deadline and they're about to go into the playoffs and they want to sign, they want to fill that last roster spot as like a break in case of emergency type of glass thing. Tracy McGrady on the Spurs kind of situation where he's on a <clears throat> excuse me, he's on a roster. We see him on TV. He's not playing though. If he plays it's 
You think? I don't think Melo would do that. You think he would? I don't think. No, I don't. I don't. I think he might consider that with the Knicks. Yeah, yeah. I think he might consider that with the Knicks. But if Milwaukee was like, "Hey, you want to be the fifteenth man, and in an emergency, you'll play," I don't think he would do that. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. You know, maybe. Isn't it crazy we're having these combos again? Yeah, it's it's sad, but I mean, you know, it's hard to believe it's happening to him, but like. This has happened to so many NBA players who didn't really deserve this end, but like, it's a business. Like, look at like guys who have been his teammate for years, great NBA players. Kenyon Martin, he didn't get to decide when that was it for him. Jr. I was just going to say, playing golf now. That's great, and that's great. But like, he, you know, I would have thought he could have stuck around a little more. And both of those guys kind of ended their careers on their own personal note but like it's a business and unfortunately sometimes they just decide when you're done yeah it sucks sucks. i think building off everything that you said i think a trade where one team gives up three four guys for one big guy makes so much sense because then they need other people so it's like cool they are going to turn to that buyout market or just free agent market um but one thing that I can't stop thinking about that I think is a win-win-win for all three parties is if the Knicks trade Obi Toppin and sign Melo. I love Obi Toppin. Yep. They are not utilizing him correctly. He is not really contributing to the team because he's being used in a spot-up role and not how he played in college and not how I personally think he should be playing um, as like a slasher, like pick and roll, like a Mari type shit. I think if they traded him and allowed him to kind of blossom elsewhere, it would help him. It would help the team. And they could bring in Melo, another guy off the bench, uh, who obviously we don't have to talk about what he means to the Knicks, and also a guy who can still score. And the Knicks are a team who, like, try priding themselves themselves defensively. Um, And they they got some guys on the team who could score now. Brunson, RJ, Randall, like... They have some. They have some pieces, and I think bringing in another guy off the bench who could just you just give it to, and and he'll go get you one. I think it makes sense for the Knicks. Um, so I think that trade right there specifically, I'm keeping a close eye on, because I love Obi and I don't like seeing what's happening to him in New York. Um, and obviously, we want Melo back in the league, and more than anywhere, me at least. I want him back on the Knicks, and I think you do too because we built that billboard together two years ago. Uh, so that's just the one thing that I'm keeping an eye on that I'm like, damn, this just makes sense on so many angles. I just hope it happens. Yeah, man. I mean, you know, I think the OB thing, it makes sense. There, I think there would be a lot of factors involved, like what are the Knicks getting back? Is it someone right. who could back up Randall? Like would they – if it's a guard, like, okay, do they want to move someone else – who's in that forward rotation to those minutes. Like, would would they start playing RJ more at forward, like a power forward to try to go yeah. small ball? I don't know. That kind of seems out of Thibodeau's nature. But it, I think for that one to work where he ends up, like, it makes sense. I feel like the stars would really have to align on that, though. But I think I think the, the other thing with the Knicks that could be helpful, and I know there's a lot of people out there who, like, love Melo and appreciate everything he's done for the Knicks, but we'll tell you like, that's not what they need right now. And I understand like the on the floor stuff, but I think that, you know, now that Derek Rose is kind of, unfortunately is a bit disconnected from the team because he's, he's not getting any minutes. We don't have any like real, we don't have the Taj Gibson role. I was just going to bring have the guy who's seen a lot. And like when they speak to everybody else on the team, like, that person commands a presence. Like, I'll listen. And I think in 2020, when they traded for Derrick Rose, he was that. And it did great things for their team. And I think because of naturally what he wants right now, which makes perfect sense, is playing time and he's not getting it. You know, I think it's probably harder for him to be in that role. Taj Gibson isn't on the team anymore. You know, so I think that role would be really perfect for him if he's willing to do it, which is a question. But I think he fit really perfectly because, look, like, is Julius Randle at the peak of his powers right now? Mellow? No. Is RJ? No. But, like, 
I think there's similarities in both of those guys' games that they could yeah. learn from him. Yeah. Even Obi, if he was there somehow, some way, if that worked out, I, I just think he brings a lot of value. I mean, we've seen him in the gym with Randall already, Kuzma. Like, I just think he brings value, even yeah. if he's sitting on a bench. Yeah, and like you mentioned it before, that's the one team where he would do that. So it then becomes a choice of, do I go to a Western Conference team if they call me to contribute and try to win a chip? Do I, you know, play limited roles in another team? Um, or do I just come back to New York and, and call it a career and fin- and get like a, a third of a farewell tour? And that'll kind of be funny. Be- and we'll get into that in a second. But like, obviously, there's this convo where it's like, cool, yo, Melo deserves a farewell tour, all this shit that, like, it's been happening for a few years, obviously, when everyone thought he was not going to be in the league. So I think <laughs> having, like, a, a expedited one, like a three-month one, um, would be kind of wild. But on that topic, yo, last interruption, I promise. But if you've been listening or watching the podcast for this long, that means you probably fuck with us, which also means you'll probably fuck with all the perks you get from being a Control the Narrative member. We send our members free merch every three months, and it's exclusive to our members. We don't also sell this on our site. It's merch only for the members. So, for example, here's one we did. We paid homage to the 2012 Knicks Christmas Day jerseys. Also, all members always get 20% off all of our general drops forever. Like, that's not capped out. That's 20% off every single purchase on our merch website. We give our members free tickets to in-person events. We have a town hall every month. We always try to think about the members first and how we can bring value to those people. So if all this shit sounds interesting to you, go to controlthenarrative.com, click become a member, pick a tier, sign up, and we will see you in the Patreon, man. Excited for this. We have a lot, a lot, a lot of cool stuff in store for these members moving forward. So go sign up if that sounds interesting to you. And I promise now we're back to the show for good. For me personally, uh, actually, I'm not going to say my opinion. I just want to get yours first. Okay. Do you think this is Melo's last season in the league no matter what? Or do you think there's any circumstance where you think he still plays in 2022, 2023, 2024? Uh, I would, if I, if I was a betting man, which I'm really not, I would say yes, because he is 38 going on 39. And if you look at the list of all time greats, when their careers ended, like he's played longer than Michael Jordan at this point. You know, so um, I think he's reached the natural conclusion. The only way I would see him continuing to play is if, again, he's added to a roster and it's some type of role that I, I we just talked about where it's this mentor bench thing. He's not playing every game, but he's playing some of the games when it makes sense. And it was, like you said, it fits the geographical location that he wants to be in. And let's say... He, he signs with this team and they make a mini playoff run and the the organization is impressed by his le- mentorship. I think they would give him that last spot and say, hey, you did this three months. Would you be interested doing one final year? We really deserve, you know, we, re- we really need that value that you bring. Would, would you be willing to do that again? That's the only way I see this ongoing because again, like, Look, LeBron's unbelievable. Like, who's who in the NBA is playing in in their forties? Like, that doesn't happen. Vince Carter. Again, but like, he's a very, on a very, very, very short list. Anybody who has is very, very short yeah. list. Dude, I don't think there's any circumstance where he plays next year at this point. Sure. And that's the first time like I'm saying that out loud, and it's fucking wild to know that like, or at at least to think like, yo, this is really it. Because the way that the last few years have went for him off season wise, I think there's zero percent chance that he tests free agency again this summer. Like yeah. to your point, like I, I can like let's say he he signed with the Knicks and the Knicks are like, yo, we actually want you another year. I still don't think he would do it if this was way before free agency, because he has other shit going on that I know yeah. that he cares about. Like obviously his son. We've talked about that a ton. He just launched a Stay Mellow clothing brand that I'm sure will take up a bunch of his time. He just launched a wine brand. It's like he has a lot of things he's working on and like focused on. And he's had to be 
like I'm sure that if he wasn't, and like I'm sure he would he would tell you that that like if he didn't have this shit, like he would go crazy because just again not having that uncertainty of whether you're gonna be playing this year, this month, this week, like whatever. I can't imagine. So I just don't think there's any way that he if if he gets signed to a team or not that he plays next year because there's no way he would want that uncertainty again. He's probably already in somewhat of a routine in terms of like, cool, this is my business, this is my family stuff, this is the stuff that I care about. Um, and that's hard to say out loud. As a guy who's followed him and he's been his my favorite athlete since 2004 and we're now in 2023, that's wild to say. And like, I'm going to watch this back when it airs and be like, holy shit, like, yo, really? Like we have probably three months left, if that, of yep. mellow basketball. Um, but again, I just don't think he, like logically, I don't think he even dares to test free agency again because of how it's gone. Um, and I don't think, and, and I just think he has other priorities that he cares about. Yeah. Just as much, if not more, than basketball. Yeah. And let's be honest, even if he was on a team right now and it was going well, it still would probably be the end and it would be hard it would be hard even if he decided that he wanted it to be his end now you know because i yeah. think it's so hard you know you think it's hard for us like he's been doing this his whole life and now it's time it's hard for us chris come on bro yeah I, yeah of course <laughs> but, and, you know and now it's time for him to hang him up you know yeah. like so i think everything you're saying is right i think in a way even if he does come back and play these like little periods that he's had of not playing probably like mentally been good for him because he's probably more prepared yeah. than a lot of other people who have been, who have retired. And cause we've seen the stories that some people retire from any sport that they've played and mentally it, it takes a lot to like be okay from that. It's crazy. It's crazy. And again, we'll see what happens, man. It's just something that, I never thought, like, when we were at MSG that one night watching, booing the shit out of Porzingis his first time back, and we're like, yo, our fucking boy is back. Like, holy shit, let's go. We're like, yo, th- thank God we don't have to go through that anymore. And then here we are, three years later. Yeah. Talking about the same shit, defending the same shit. Um, and speaking about defending, a good little transitioning to what I want to speak to next because I watched the game the other night. Philly, Philly and Denver. It was great. A great game. Embiid versus Jokic, mm-hmm. and Embiid is, in my opinion, the best big man in the NBA. I know a lot of people don't feel that way, or at least that's probably not the majority. Um, and I say that Embiid is is that great because it's hard to guard him. It's pretty much impossible. He's athletic. He's skilled. He's strong. He's tall. All this shit, but. I just find it really weird that the guy who won back-to-back MVPs, his defense isn't talked about as much as a guy who comes off the bench for a vet men. So I'm, I'm being serious when I ask you this. On January 31st, 2023, based on what you know about, about Carmelo Anthony's oh, I'm scared. shape. Okay, here we go. About, about Carmelo Anthony's shape, who do you think is a better defender? Melo or Nikola Jokic? We're talking about 38-year-old Carmelo Anthony. 38-year-old Carmelo versus... Carmelo Anthony oh. at 26, 27 years old. Yeah, Jokic is 27. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to fall into this trap. <laughs> um, Honest I, question, Chris. I, 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 I feel like I have to go with... The, the Joker in, in this scenario, unfortunately, I will give you, he is not the best defender. Uh, I think that has been talked about a lot in his past. Uh, I think now that he has hit a certain level of stardom, it gets swept under the rug a little bit. Um, but I do think one of the reasons that they haven't gotten as far as you would think they have given his talent is one of those things and is his conditioning, which has improved over every year. So you have to give him credit for that. But I think at this point he's passable for a defender, which isn't great. But I think that Melo in his 
peak of powers was passable as a defender. The only difference that I will say between both of those statements is Jokic is passable, and I don't know if he can actually get any better. And this is a huge knock on Melo that multiple people have mentioned. He is passable because he wants to be passable. If he really wants to commit to defending, he could be pretty good. And I'll never forget game two of the Western Conference Finals. They won that game in L.A. against Kobe. Mike Preen watched Melo defend Kobe on like one of the most important possessions of the game. And I forget who he's doing. He's probably doing the game with Mark Jackson. He turns like, that's the best defense I've ever seen Anthony play. I've never seen him play defense like that. So that is my very diplomatic roundabout way <laughs> fair. of answering that question. That's completely fair because uh, I genuinely – I'm not saying this for clicks. I'm not saying this for views. I genuinely believe that when I watch Carmelo Anthony defend, he plays better defense right now and, like, a.k.a. last year than Nikola Jokic does this year. And – Though obviously we know the kind of backstory between these two of and there's really not like beef or anything, but Jokic wears 15 and Melo wore 15. Yep. And as a Melo fan, I thought that was disrespectful. So like I'm generally trying to think without bias. And again, I he was going up against Embiid. So I'm not sitting here and be like, yo, Embiid scored 47. Like what the fuck? He sucks. And Embiid could score 47 on any single human on earth. Um but time and time again, I think it's so crazy that I, I think narratives are crazy because you don't hear about the back-to-back -back MVP's defense at all, like at all. And like you said in the past a little bit, but to your point, in the playoffs, he gets hunted. In the regular season, he gets hunted and nobody talks about it because he does some like crazy pass or because he's funny or like it's like that Giannis shit where like. Giannis can put his his foot under someone and, and sprain someone's ankle, but if he talks about Oreos in the in the post game, it's all straight. I genuinely feel that he's such a bigger liability than Melo defensively, and Melo's defense gets talked about so much more when he's on a vetman contract or could be on a vetman contract coming off the bench. And this dude Jokic is a back to back MVP who hasn't taken his team to a finals and it, and it gets swept under the rug. Like you said, like, I think it's so crazy. And again, the whole point of, of this podcast and, and the reason I started this is because I think when I watch games, it doesn't add up certain things it doesn't add up yeah. with the, the grand scheme narrative of things. Mm -hmm. And this Jokic shit, I feel like is part of it because again, in the NBA, not that many people play defense. Um, so to me, Knowing that and knowing that people still to this day are like, yo, Melo's not in the league because it's defense. I'm like, bro, do you understand that this dude is coming off the bench and playing 20 minutes a game? It's not like he's getting hunted in throughout the game. And even when he was that Rockets game, right, when, when they tried going at him, he held the Rockets to a lower field goal percentage than they shot as a team. So, like, it didn't work. So, that's I also, not about answer. Yeah, you know, I also think, too, like, at that age, playing those minutes, I mean, you could if that was a role player, any Joe Schmo, how big of a deal like would it be? You know, who Jokic or Melo? You're talking about Melo. Just on that defense as a role player, like I think it's like okay, you you know, I think it was Bill Simmons was like, there's like the 96 percent rule, like if 96 percent of what a player does is great, I'll live with the remaining that he does bad. And to me, that's kind of how I've always looked at Melo because it's like, yeah, he'll bring the shooting, uh, you know, he'll bring uh, the offensive repertoire of, okay, yeah, he, you know how many 3 and D guys are in the NBA who, like, can't pull up or handle the ball or do any of that? Like, he could yeah. literally pump fake you at the three-point line, spin around you, and all of a sudden he's posting you and he's shooting a fadeaway over you. Yeah. Like, he'll bring that diverse uh, – skill set into the yeah. offense he'll bring mentorship and like yeah he's not a good defender and a lot of that now back then i think you could make the effort claim at times now i don't think it's an effort thing i think it's that this is the body he has now he's at this age where he's done like basically playing basketball like he can't keep up with someone who's 22 
like that. Like he tries hard. hard. And he no. tries hard. And that's what I'm saying. Like all you can ask is he tries. And I think the one thing that doesn't really get talked about enough that they want to harp on his defense is he he has really good instincts and savvy. Like he's still I I don't see anyone in the NBA today uh doing that defensive swipe he does yeah. as well as he did it. He averaged he's almost a block a game last year. Yeah, he's very good at getting steals and blocks that way. And yeah, can he get caught in a pick and roll and just get burned uh, with the right player? Of course. But every player can. Of course. Every of player. course. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's like, again, if you're a team like the Lakers who had no defense, maybe don't sign Mello. <laughs> you know, like – the GMs have to take some accountability for building teams. The players shouldn't always get all the fault. You know, like I think a team like the Knicks who plays pretty solid defense can take that sacrifice and be like, all right, he's going to be out there. Yeah. But when we do play Melo, we're going to make sure the the other players we have on the floor with him can kind of like make up for that defensive ability. If they're going to sign him. I mean, they did it with the Thunder when he was there. They were like fourth in defensive efficiency. That was a great defensive team. And he again, we'll say it, he's not a good defender, but he was out there with Westbrook at like probably his peak athletic ability. Paul George, who is what he is, Steven Adams, Andre Roberson. You know, like there's ways to get around it if you need the thing that he brings. If you need shooting, like they'll figure it out, you know? And also I think it's very important to note that when we say he's not, and this is something that we've talked about a lot of times on the spot. I don't, probably not with you on the pod, but when people say he's not a good defender, that doesn't mean he's a bad defender. It just means that he's not locking anybody down. And there's a handful of people who can do that. Like, I always want to put that in there because so many people say that. And like, how many people can you really point to in the NBA today and say, that's a good defender? Like, yeah. seriously? If we're being like 100% serious, less than 10, 15 max. For max. Sure. That you're like, yeah, that's a good defender right there. So, again, it just feels like Melo is being singled out because there's always going to be a weakest defender on the court, whether that's the power forward, whether that's the center. If it's a big guy getting a point guard on him, like, it's just basketball. It's like not understanding the game of like, yo, if Melo wasn't in the game, like, they would have won at Dwight Howard. They would have isolated him at the three-point line if – you know, instead they got Chris Paul on the switch. They would tell Aiton, and obviously they're on the same team, but they would tell Aiton just to go and post them up. Like, it's just things like that that people and, like, casuals don't understand. And if they played a little basketball, if they actually looked at X's and O's, um, and I actually want to control the narrative after uh, as well with you, but um, that they would realize, and they yeah. just don't. So, Dude, just... you know, like – Think about the Knicks mellow era with Tyson Chandler. How many times did Tyson Chandler get switched onto a guard and get burned? Because While he was big, defensive player of the year. Yeah. It's just basketball. You All you ask is for all your guys to be passable. Just effort. You know? And like I said, again, in the prime of his career, if you want to question that, fine. But at this age, like I think he's giving it. And, you know, if you need the shooting, you live with it. So, yeah. And also last, last thing on this, I promise is he's a great defensive leader vocally. Yep. Like that makes a big deal. That's whether awesome. it's like, you know, telling people to switch, whether telling people to rotate, like that's a huge deal. And you constantly heard him last year in LA and in the years prior in Portland talking defensively, which is an underrated skill, but. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. But it comes with experience. Yeah. Exactly. And even when you have 19 years of defensive experience and people still want to talk shit about your defense, look, look what he's done. Just go watch. Um, like he's made game ceiling, games ceiling steals and things like that. But anyway, just wanted to, to have that convo because it's just something that I feel people don't talk about enough. Jokic being a poor defender. And like, again, today, not many people really play defense, but – in my opinion, I always thought the best players had to be on two sides of the ball. That's why I was I was told that Melo never won an MVP because he only plays one side. And then now we have Jokic over here, and he's back-to-back, -back, maybe back-to-back-to-back. -to -back -to -back. Steve Nash won back-to-back -back MVP. Steve Nash should have won defense. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, talk to Shaq about that. Yeah, fair. So. Fair enough. 
Um, all right, Chris, I think this was an important episode. I feel like last week we had Gary Forbes on, and then we didn't really talk too, too much mellow, but just like a state of the mellow union address, like we'll know in three weeks max really what's going to happen. So I think this was a good way to kind of preview everything and get whoever's listening or watching ready uh, <laughs> one way or another for uh, for wh whatever's about to happen in this month of February. But as always, bro, I appreciate you hopping on. And I know we've been trying to do this for a little bit. So happy we finally got this shit in. But before I let you go, as you know, we always let our guests control a narrative. It doesn't have to be mellow related. It doesn't have to be basketball related. It doesn't even have to be sports related. So if you have one, I'll give you the floor to control a narrative. Absolutely, man. I do have one. It's very simple this time. Literally, do not take your health for granted. Just don't. Um, I think uh, there are a lot of – life is hard. There are a lot of things that, like, happen every day that are very little that piss us off royally. And uh, I think uh, it's, it's really important at times when those things happen to take a step back and think about, like, what you have – and then whatever it is that's like pissing you off at work or your family or friends or whatever, it doesn't seem very important anymore. Um, and, you know, your health is everything. So, yeah, that's it. Some Gary V perspective shit right there, man. <laughs> yeah. You know, we, we kind of went through that a lot, obviously, with fucking COVID. Yep. I don't know. I feel like, obviously, when that all that shit happened, it was like, oh, fuck. Like, yeah, health is number one. I don't know. I feel like we kind of gotten away from that. How's it going? For sure. For sure. I have one that I thought about while we were speaking. Hell yeah. Let's hear and it. And I saw a tweet about this or a video about it or something. But the moral of the story was there was like a nine minute video from an NFL network channel or like a pregame show or something like that. And the entire nine minutes, they were talking about football. Like actual football, X's and O's, like schematic football. Yeah. And I feel like NBA, and again, this is one of the points of the show and, and, and the podcast. And the NBA, it just seems like it's very political. It's very personality based. It's very like when you watch inside the, the NBA on, on TNT, like Kenny usually does, you know, that one video segment. Yep. But other than that, it's a lot of gossip. It's pro like, wrestling. It's what? It's pro wrestling. Yeah. Yeah. Like literally Shaq, like we, Shaq is a legend, obviously all these things, but him talking, like I would never hear, and I, I don't really watch the NFL like that, but Shaq saying he doesn't watch the Wizards or the Bullets, so he doesn't know who Rui Hachimura is. Like that's a crazy thing to say when you're an analyst for TNT, like a national broadcast network for your sport. And I, I like thought about it. once I saw that nine minute video, I'm like, bro, that's all they were talking about. Like they were talking about like, yo, this right wing uh, defensive lineman when he goes this way. Like, and I feel like that's being, that's being lost, especially with all this analytics where it's just like very by the book. It's very, all the stuff. And it's like, I don't know. I just thought it was something that popped out of me that I was like, wow. I've never seen a nine minute segment of any NBA show or personality just strictly breaking down the game. And I think that'd be cool. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. I think it happens less and less. I think exactly what you're looking for is a very niche area that goes on right now. Off the top of my head, I think uh, the low post with Zach Lowe, his podcast, I think of, uh, Quentin Richardson and Darius Miles, the knuckleheads. Yeah, that's a good one. This is like that, that really focus in on the X's and O's. Um, but yeah, I, I, the mainstream media is throwing that out the window. And I agree, man. We need it back because that's what yeah. makes the game great. It makes the game great. And it just feels like it's, like again, very gossipy. And I feel like it'll also, real basketball fans will love that. Like people who just yeah. watch for personalities, they'll get turned off. And, like, again, the reason the NBA is so big is because of those personalities. Like, if all they talked about was X's and O's and, like, didn't really market the players like that, which you would be marketing the players like that and you would grow the game of basketball. And it is. Like, I'm not sitting here being like, yo, the game of basketball. It's like we're not talking about baseball here where it's going down pretty much every single year um, besides Aaron Judge 
pretty much single-handedly bringing it back. Um, but I, I just think it's something that's interesting. And, like, I want to have a pod like that where one day we literally just watch game footage and be like, yo, Break look at Mello's Hell yeah. Yeah, like, yo, look at Mello's footwork on this play and shit like that versus, yo, Daryl Morey and all this yeah. shit. And, like, so, sometimes – I'm, I'm guilty of doing that. Like, I'm not going to sit here and be like, no, nah, yo, we only talk X and O's because that's not the case. And I'm not saying it has to be 100%. I just think, to your point of like, instead of it becoming less and less, I think it should be more and more. And and again, the personalities kind of complement that. But For sure, man. For sure. That's an art if I wanted to control. So thank you for giving me the floor, Chris, and hearing me out on that one. Absolutely, man. Um, word, dude. All right, man. For real, I appreciate your time, like always. Uh, we will try to get another one in. We'll see what happens, man. It's going right. to be a very, very interesting month. Yeah, hell yeah. God. We'll know by the end of this month whether we get to continue watching Carmelo play basketball or not. Yep. So thanks for your time, Chris, as always, bro. Thanks. And uh, stay mellow, baby. Absolutely. You too, man. Peace, bro.